glory, risen conquering sun, endless is the victory, thou O death hast won, and no more we doubt of thee, glorious prince of life. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. Not sermons, but really looking here at living life truly after the Spirit. Now this is really for uh, people who are already born again Christians, okay? I know we have people that are, are searching, they're searching for truth. They haven't maybe gotten to that point where they found it yet or they've, uh, they've accepted it yet. But this is for people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, the book of, Revel, uh, book of Romans, I should say, the book of Romans really has three different sections to it. The first part of the book of Romans deals with sin. Okay, If you want to know man's condition, you want to know where man is and why man's the way he is and how bad he can get, get into the, the, the first part of the book of Romans, you will find out it talks about sin. Later on, it starts, moves on and starts talking about salvation. Praise God for salvation, because if we were left in the sin, then we would be left under the judgment of God. But God has made a way. And we've looked at this a few weeks ago when I was preaching on the fact that John 3, 16, for so God so loved the world, and that was in the past, loved in the past. In other words, he loved you before you were even created. He loved the world before he even created it. He, in other words, loved, he was committed to it. He was going to try to restore it. He already knew we were going to mess up. He already knew that. And yet he still loved us, he still committed to us so much that he offered Jesus Christ, his son, to die in our stead. Now later on, right after the, Lord, uh, after the, uh, the, the preaching this morning, we're going to have the Lord's table. And we're going to look at two elements that Jesus uh, offered up on that cross. We're going to look at his uh, broken body, he was beaten and bruised for your sake and uh, my sake, and then we're going to look at the, the grape juice, which represents the shed blood, and that was what the, the father was looking at, because when he saw the, the life flow out of the, the, the body of his son, Jesus Christ, he said, that's it. He said, he offered his life for me, he, or for you, I should say. He offered it to the father. So there, there's a lot that's, that's there in salvation in the book of Romans. So we have sin, we have salvation. Well, then what after salvation? I mean, what do you do after you're saved? Do we just sit around? Some people do. They just sit around and they just wait till God calls again or comes again or whether he takes us through, uh, through death, whatever it is, we just sit around and waste. And, and the, the bulk, uh, really, of Romans is what about after salvation? After you've realized that you're a sinner before our holy God, after you accepted his uh, son Jesus Christ's sacrifices and made him your personal savior, then what? Well, then you've just begun, okay? Life has just begun. I hope when people get saved and people get baptized, they don't think that's the end of it. Because some people think it is, and they just walk away. Well, you get reading the rest of the Bible, and you find a lot of that Bible is what do you do after, afterwards, after you've met the Savior and you've accepted him. So the, 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 the great thing in this dispensation that we live in here in the church age is that God has not only has he given us his Son as our, to be our Savior, but he's given us the Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to indwell the believer so that the believer would have the presence of God on board in his very body. That's amazing. That blows my mind away. So if you become a born-again Christian, you find that there's two different poles inside of you. You, you want to do things like the old way for the flesh just to please yourself, and who, who cares about God? It's all about me. But you also feel this other pull that's saying, no, get back to the Word of God. Go through God's way. That's because you are, you are a, a dual citizen, if you will. And it, it, it's kind of tough living and navigating this world as a Christian. It's very difficult. And so I'm, I'm so glad that God has given us a direction through His Word. And God has given us his presence in the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I don't see the Holy Spirit. No, because he's, he is immaterial. He does not possess matter like we do, just like your soul. You are more than just your body. You know that. You realize that. You have a, a thought process. You, have, you feel guilty at times. You feel anger. You feel emotion. You feel all these things. 
You, don't, you can't weigh that. It's because it's immaterial. It's that part of you that can't be weighed. Well, when we receive the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit's the same thing. It's, well, I can't weigh him. I, I don't experience him. I don't feel any change in temperature. I don't do it. it no, because he's the Holy Spirit. You might feel sometimes the results of his presence there, but him, him himself, you don't. But he's there, and you say, well, how do you know he's there? Because the word of God says so. He indwells the believer. And I also do feel his presence. When I read God's word, I'll tell you something. I feel, it depends, usually I feel guilty because I know I'm over here and he wants me over there. And I get into his word and the Holy Spirit starts pulling me in the right direction. And so, so I kind of get that idea. And then sometimes I feel very elated knowing that I have his presence with me. And it, it's a very amazing thing to know that God's with you. And I want God to be with you. And I want you to experience that. And so does the Apostle Paul. That's why God used him to pen these words if we get looking into Romans chapter 8. So we looked, if you go to the next slide, please, this is what we looked at last week. We looked at living after the Spirit. We looked at uh, walk in the Spirit. We looked set your minds in the uh, on the things of the Spirit, we looked at kill the deeds of the body uh, um, of the, uh, through the Spirit. So we, we see these things that we, we were looking at there. And walking after the Spirit, it, it's a miraculous event initiated uh, by this practical goal that God wants for us, and, and it requires discipline. You know, you're not, when you become a Christian, you're not just like a car stuck in neutral, and you're waiting for God to give you a push. God's not going to just do it that way, all right? He wants you to get in high gear, and he wants you to walk in the Spirit. That means you've got to do something. That means Christians are called upon to be knowledgeable from the Word of God, and we are to make the right decisions, and we're to dis discipline ourselves to walk in the Spirit. It's an active engagement that we're to be involved in. So many Christians are in neutral, just sitting and waiting for some kind of weird thing to happen, some kind of miraculous thing just to strike them or to get them going. Listen, you've got it right here in the Word of God. Read it and let the Holy Spirit start giving you a kick and get going with the Lord because He wants us to have active lives. Walk after the Spirit. The other thing we saw, that second part there, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. As I said last week, one of the, the Satan's most powerful weapons upon uh, any Christian is to get you so busy that he keeps you away from the miraculous word of God. And you will be so busy, even doing good things, we saw that, just even, even doing and getting involved in good events, as long as he gets you doing anything but getting to that book that's going to change your life as a Christian. I'm not talking about getting to be a Christian. I'm talking after a Christian. After you're a Christian, Satan still wants to get you away from that book. No, he can't take your soul because it belongs to God, all right? You understand that? Once you get saved, you are forever saved, okay? God does not work like we work, okay? He's, as I said before, he's not a deadbeat dad. He doesn't leave you alone. He's always there waiting for you, and he's got this book for you. So here's what Satan does. Satan says, all I got to do, all I got to do for the Christian is keep that Christian away from that book. Just stay away from that book. Stop reading that book because the power of the Holy Spirit in that person is going to be drawn right to that Word of God, and they're going to, they're going to confess their sins, they're going to get their heart right, and they're going to keep course adjusting themselves, and they're going to start doing things, miraculous things for God here on this earth. So the last thing Satan wants you to do as a Christian is to read that book. What's one of the first things we do as Christians? Hey, I know enough. I know enough. I know Jesus Christ in my, in my life. And so I'll just take the Bible, I'll put it up on the shelf. It'll collect all kinds of dust. And uh, maybe I'll read other things. I'll do everything. But I'll stay away from this book. Okay? I read books. I read other books. I read other theology books and, and other types of books and stuff like that. And I find them interesting. But I know this, that I have to make this the main book. This, I always have to go back to this book. And if I read something somewhere else, and I, I don't know if that's true or not, how do I know if it's true or not? Go back to the book, okay? I can't say it enough. What we try to preach and teach here is the book, okay? The Bible, the Word of God, because everything else is just the words and philosophies of man. And I ain't going to do you any good, okay? There's all kinds of them. This has a power to it, okay? I'm trying to tell you, you do not need to find the Ark of the Covenant. You don't have to go with Indiana Jones on any excursion trying to find something because I ain't going to do you. A hunk of wood ain't going to do you any good. You understand? You don't need to find the chalice the, uh, you know, that carried the blood of Christ and all this stuff. You don't have to go on, the, on, on these mumble-jumble things, the excursions. you got it right here in the Word of God. Read it! 
God has given us the power right here. He's given us the words of life right here. But he wants to keep you, even as a Christian, he wants to keep you away from digging deeper because he doesn't want you to get to know the power of the awesome Holy Spirit that's inside of you. He doesn't want that unleashed inside of you. So, yeah, he can't take away your soul. You're, you're destined for eternal life once you're saved. But the one thing he can do, the one thing he can do is keep you from that book by keeping you so busy, so busy that you're not reading it anymore. Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Thirdly, kill the deeds of, your, of the body through the Spirit. It's time to take charge of your, your actions and your decisions. One thing I cannot stand is when there's a, a person or a group of people and they're always victims. I can't do anything because I'm a victim. It's your fault. No, 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 no. God says, no, no. It's the individual's fault. Take responsibility for yourself, okay? Even as a Christian, don't say, well, you know, I guess God's not blessing me. Well, how much time are you spending with God? Are you asking him for help? Are you praying to him? Are you witnessing for him? What are you doing with God in your Christian life? Well, I'm not doing anything. Well, then don't expect anything. Because I'm sorry, he's not the government. He's not going to do everything for you because he doesn't need your vote. You understand? God doesn't need you. He doesn't need your vote. He doesn't have to coddle you. What he wants to do is he wants to bring you up and conform you into the image of his marvelous son, Jesus Christ. But that takes responsibility. You have to start walking. You have to take accountability for that. Let's go to the next one. That was all last week anyway. What's going on this week? Be led by the Spirit. You got your Bibles? Well, let's read the Bible. I talked about it enough, didn't I? Amen. Let's read it. Okay, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Be led by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that it doesn't say, for as many as are following the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God? Sadly, there are times in every Christian's life we are not following after God. There's times. If you're honest as a Christian, there are times you wander away on your own. But it doesn't say that for as many as are following the Spirit of God. But it says those who are led by the Spirit of God. And as I said before, sometimes we wander off. And that is why I'm so glad that David wrote Psalm 23. What did he say? Now, by the way, there was a person who had a heart after God, and yet he found himself wandering away. Yet he says this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Why did he restore it? Because you let it go. So he brings it back. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And this leading by God did not end in the Old Testament. For Jesus said this, and I'll just read it to you. John chapter 10, verse 14, you know what I'm going to say? I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Boy, I tell you something. There's, there's, one, there's one thing that seems to go right throughout the whole Bible, and that is, is we need a shepherd. We need a leader. Okay, We need somebody to be led. I, and... Uh, no, we do not verify our Christian, um, our Christian faith by leading a perfect life. You realize that because you can't do it. If you're trying to prove that you're a Christian to people because you're perfect, well, you're not going to be proving too much to too many people because you're going to fail all the time. We verify our Christian faith by growing closer to Christ with a continual walk that requires many, many course corrections along the way. You're going to need course corrections. You're going to need God to kind of come along and, and just to give you a jolt there and give you a little shot of, hey, I'm doing something wrong. And it's called feeling guilty. We live in a world where everybody's trying. We're trying. We put a label on everything we can. We put these big, long words on everything because we don't want anybody to feel guilty. You know what? I think sometimes we need to feel guilty, not artificially guilty, but we need to get in the Word of God. And we find guilt happens when a Christian knows they're supposed to be over here, but they're over here. And then there's a guilt. There's a problem. Well, if you don't feel guilty, you're never going to correct that problem. So what does the, what does the world do? This world says, oh, we'll put bandages on things, we'll cover up things, we'll give them fancy names, and we'll never make anybody feel guilty, so they'll never be accountable, they'll never have to get right. How does that work, by the way, folks? 
Sometimes I wonder, I, I don't, some nights I don't know if I'd want to walk down the street because there's people out there who are going to kill you. And I knew known this, that the government ain't going to do a whole lot about it. Yeah. They're going to give somebody a big fancy lawyer with a bunch of big fancy names. And if I don't have more money than the other guy has for my lawyers, they're going to win regardless of what they do to me. Yeah. Welcome to the world. We're the world here. Okay, so we, we have to be, be careful because uh, there, there's this lack of guilt in the world. What I need to do, and you need to do, is, if you're a Christian, get into the Word of God. Don't be afraid of it. A lot of people don't read it because it's like, oh, I hate to see what it's going to say about me. No, you need that because the Lord wants to be your shepherd. He wants to shepherd you. He wants you to make course corrections. He wants you to closer, closer, closer to him, more and more like his son, Jesus Christ, every day. Okay, you can never be perfect, but you can always be closer. And that's what he's doing here. That's why we need a, a shepherd here. So, uh, God takes great delight in leading his children. He loves it. He loves being a leader. He loves, he loves that, that role. In the Old Testament times, uh, Israel was led across a, a trackless land, okay, by God. There was this pillar of fiery smoke in that, and it would lead Israel. I mean, there was no path. There were no highways. There were no roads. There was just this wilderness, this desert. They didn't know which way to go, which way to turn. So God said, hey, I'm the leader here. I'm your shepherd. Follow this. And even the youngest of the Hebrew children grew up realizing that God's presence was there and that God was the leader, and they would follow. Anytime that, that pillar, that, that column would move, they would follow after it. That's God. That's a God who cares about you. That's a God who wants to be your leader, who wants to take your life and make it something. But you have to follow him for that to happen. But he will be the leader. And yet, uh, uh, it is still God who, who leads his children today, even though, even though we don't have Jesus Christ physically here. We don't. He bodily is not on the earth. So, uh, I mean, if, if this was 2,000 years ago, we could say, well, where's, where's Jesus preaching this week? And a lot of crowd did that, and they would follow, and they would all follow around wherever Jesus went, and they would try to, to follow him. But we don't have him anymore. He's, he's at the right hand of the Father. He's ascended back up into heaven. We don't have the pillars anymore. We don't have any miracles, that, that, the manifestations that God does. God doesn't work that way anymore. He works a better way. He still leads, but he works a better way. It's called the Holy Spirit. And that's when you get into Revelation chapter, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8, and you start reading that, that chapter over and over again. You find out that he's the new leader. The Holy Spirit himself, God, the third person of God himself, comes in and dwells every believer, puts their trust in Jesus Christ, and dwells them, and he's now the pillar. He's now uh, representing the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is now directing us. It's an amazing thing, being led by the Spirit. Okay, Now, today God leads us through his written word, which was revealed to the prophets by the Holy Spirit himself. You go to the next slide, please. And you'll see there, there's a, there's a classic passage right there, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and, and 21. It says, knowing this uh, first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. See, there's a lot of old books out there, a lot of them. Actually, I bought a, a few of them in, in Bible college. I've got like a whole couple walls full of books that were written by guys 100 years ago or so and that. And there's even older books that are thousands of years old. But the Bible's trying, or what the Word of God is trying to do is distinguish itself from all other books. There is no other book like this book. Right. Oh, you'll get enthralled by all these other writers. And these, you, who's your favorite author? I, I, I want people to ask me that question because sometimes that comes up, you know. Hey, what's your favorite author? Oh, I like that. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Because if you read it here, it says here, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, okay, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Who's the author? And eventually got penned down here. Who's the, who's the author? The, well, there's writers, many writers were used, but there's one author. And that's why that book all fits together. And that's why it's still as valid today, it's still as powerful today, still saving souls today like it did two, 3,000 years ago, because it's from God. And I'll tell you something, you'll never go wrong by, by following it. We are to prayerfully, carefully, and humbly apply broad biblical wisdom to the situations in life we, f we face. 
The Holy Spirit can choose to act in any way according to, uh, and to its time, own timetable, the way he wishes, uh, but he never violates his own word. So you can always trust that he's never going to lead you off in, into a tangent where you shouldn't go. God will never lead you in the wrong direction. You know what? Man will. Preachers will. Okay? Priests will. Uh, I'm trying to think. Deacons will. I'm just going to go down the whole list. Sunday school teachers might. Uh, there's a lot of people that eventually will because we're just human beings. Okay? We need to be led too. Here's your leader. Get into the book. The only thing I can do as a, as a pastor, the, the, I guess sh- I should say the best thing I could do as a pastor is to get into the book and expound it, expose it, and, and reveal it to you. I mean, that's the best thing I can do. We, we can do all kinds of, we can all kind of have kinds of fellowships and sing songs and everything else, but my most important thing that, uh, that I have to do is I got to get into this book and I got to feed you like a shepherd feeds the sheep. I have to do that on, as an under shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what you can do, and you can do this every week, go home, listen to the preaching, go home, and then check it out to see if what I'm saying is true or not, okay? And sometimes I might need to be adjusted myself. Maybe I'm wrong myself. I need to hear it so I can adjust it and become a better preacher. But one thing we all have, one rule that we all have to compare ourselves with is the Word of God, because it's perfect, and it's pure, and it's beautiful, it's wonderful. It's God's way of leading us to be led by the Spirit. I have a lot of people, and this is what you'll see a lot in these days. You'll see a lot of people on TV, a lot of the charismatics and that, and they're all going and they're all saying, hey, I just felt led by the Spirit today to do this and to do that and, uh, you know, to tell you, uh, Brother Jeff, give me 100 bucks. The Holy Spirit told me to tell you that. And I'm like, uh, okay, and then your answer is, well, as soon as God tells me that, then I'll join in with you, right? And that, but you see, what they don't do is they don't say, open up your Bibles and let's, let's thoroughly examine this. No, they don't, they don't want you to have the Bible. I mean, there's a lot of religions that don't want I grew up uh, Anglican. They didn't. It's not that they didn't want me to have the Bible. It's that we just never needed it. I went in. We had prayer books. We had, you know, we did things, and we heard stories of, uh, of the Bible and stuff like that, but we never got into it. And I'm thinking, what the, the uh, did you, uh, look at that, folks. Look at that, Okay. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I want that book, okay? I don't want this written by somebody else or, or something by somebody else. I want that book, okay? Why is it you go to a church and the last thing they give you is that book? I mean, sometimes the only guy who has that book is the person standing up here. But you, you don't have it, and you don't know if he's saying it right. You don't get to go home and compare it throughout the week. But noble people do, according to the scriptures, because that's how God leads us today. Oh, it would be great to have Jesus right here. I would love to physically to have him here. I, I, know, I know what I'd be doing. I'd be falling right down on my face before him right now. But I'd love to have him right here. But he's not here right now, and he told his disciples that. He says, I must go. But he says, if I go, I will pray, and the Father will send another. And he's talking about the Holy Ghost. And and the Holy Ghost is the author of this book. So what I'm trying to say to you, folks, is that we need to be people of the book. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to challenge ourselves with that. Because as I said, that first verse there, knowing this, uh, that no prophecy of Scripture is uh, of any private interpretation. Uh, There are old books that are of private interpretation. In other words, they were made up by people. Okay? Uh, there, were, there are whole faiths. There are whole faiths, not, not Christian faith, but whole faiths that have, have developed because somebody, a man or a woman, wrote a book. But God says here, he says, but there's only one book that he puts his stamp of approval on, and it is the Bible. Therefore, I would be seeking out that for my leading uh, if there's anything else to be led by. So we are to be led by the Spirit, and that makes us followers. And let me ask you this question. How are you at following the Holy Spirit's leading? Have you been into the book lately? Have you been asking God to search your heart as you read the book? Or have you been trying to wing it, just trying to just do it on your own? I'll figure this out myself. I'll navigate through life on, on my own. There are a lot of choices to make in life. And it doesn't end. You think, well, when you get older, you'll have less choices. No, we have more choices. I have a lot of choices I have to make all the time. 
I found myself in a spot where not only do I make maybe not so much choice for my children now, but you see, now I've got an aging mom. I have to make choices for her in the nursing home. And I have to make choices for my wife and my own self, for our health, our finances, and everything else. And so do you. Some of you are on the other end right now is that you're, you're young enough that you have children. You're not maybe dealing with an older parent yet. Maybe you are. But uh, you, you have children, and you have to make choices for them. And those choices are big choices to be made. You know what happens with most people, Christians? Most Christians is they relegate it to a Christian school, or they say, go talk to the pastor. But what they need to be doing is take the Bible, go home, and open it up with the kids. And say, hey, kids, let's look at this. And that might take you uh, getting some, you can also get some material. You can read it ahead of yourself, come up with a lesson. But it's having a game plan to be able to enlighten your children as to how important the leading from God's word is. And may they see it in your life. Don't wing it, man. Don't, don't do that. Be led. The Holy Spirit's there to lead us. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is trying to tell us something, trying to kick us in, in, in the back of the pants. They're saying, hey, listen, you've got to keep with the word. Don't deviate from it. So as a Christian, the greatest restriction you face is the face that you see in the mirror every day. That's the greatest restriction. Nobody's saying you can't read your Bible. Nobody's, holding, nobody's twisting your arm. If you were able to make it in here today, I guarantee you, you have enough freedom that you can open that book anytime you want. If you, if you were to make it here today in the society we live in, the greatest enemy you face is the face you'll see in the, in the mirror. That's the one that's going to restrict you. The devil's not going to do it. Oh, yeah, the devil wants to keep you busy, but the devil can't, the devil can't do this if you say no to the devil. Do you understand that? You've got to take accountability for yourself, and so do I. We have to be accountable for our lives. We have to say, Lord, I know what you're saying here, and I and may have to make a decision, and you have to have a discipline. And that's why they called them disciples. Because Jesus had disciples. These were guys who were being schooled. They were learning a discipline because one day those disciples were going to be the apostles. They were going to go from, from learners to teachers. And that's what all of us have to be. My whole purpose is not to have you come to me for every little thing, maybe some things, but for most things, you should be able to learn how to use this skillfully to seek out your own answers and to prayerfully ask God to open and expose some truths here that you can apply to your life. This is reality, okay? This is amazing. This is, I, I, now, I now have a way to navigate myself through life, and I know for sure it's right because it's in here. There's a lot of things, a lot of decisions you have to make, and, and, and you're going to make some heart-wrenching decisions. Life and death matters are going to come up from time to time. But if you've been consistently into the Word of God, and yes, you, you seek out my opinion or, or, or Pastor Joe's opinion or some of the other men and ladies in here that have been around for a while with the Word of God, you seek some opinion, that's good. But you yourself also have to be in here because you need to be led. You need to use the leader, but you have to be led. Stop fighting the shepherd. Stop fighting him. I will say one thing that was good about David is that when he messed up, he knew where to run to to get it right. And we need to learn that too. And the thing I love about being a Christian, let me tell you something, I love this about being a Christian, is that I can mess up. I don't, I don't know how much I, I can mess up. But I, I hope it's not too much, but I can mess up a lot and I can cut, burn, and break down a lot of bridges between people. But if I will have a contrite heart and if I will turn back to my God, he will always be like this to me. If I go down and I humble myself to him and I have broken heart and I go to him, he will always be there for me. He will always be there for you as a born-again Christian. He will always be there for you. Now, other Christians might not be. People in your own family might not because they're human too. They, they might be hurt. might take them a while. They might not ever get over it. Here's God, though. Always. Why? Come on, let's go. I got more for you to do. My goodness. I've been in churches where what they do is they beat you up, man. They beat you, beat you, beat you, beat you, beat you, beat you up. And they try with guilt and stuff like that. The only guilt I want is from God. I want God to give me true guilt so I know that, it's the wrong, that I need to correct things, and then I follow after him. Boy, I'll tell you something. We've got to be careful in the church. We have to make sure that we bring God into every decision we make, even collectively as a church, that we're led by the Holy Spirit of God. We cannot go off on our own tangents. Folks, I've tried that. It gets weird after a while. 
Next thing you know, I'm doing marketing blitzes and all kinds of things, trying to calm people in the church, and you're trying to do all kinds of things you, and stuff. Or we could just let God lead us, and collectively as a body of church, uh, church uh, for Christ, we can do it God's way and let God bless us as God sees fit. Just saying. Next thing. It says here in Romans, let's go down to uh, chapter 8, verse 15. Know the Father of God by the Spirit. The, I'm sorry, the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. It says there in verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Many times I have had people pity me. Can you imagine that? People pitying me. But they do. I've had it. I had, especially people at work, when you work a secular job, I've had people, they assume because when they find out you're a Christian, they assume that you have all these, these strict reg regulations that your life must be just miserable, you know, because you get, oh, you, got, you can't do this and do that. And, and I had one guy who had, uh, I, where I was working somewhere, he was an older guy, and I was like 20 or something. I was in Bible college. I remember he had a, he had a magazine. It, it, it wasn't pornography, but it had women who were wearing short shorts on motorcycles. You know what I'm talking about? You know those books? You shouldn't know those books. Don't you read those magazines? But anyway, so he's there, and we're sitting there, and we're getting ready to, to do our shift, and he pulls out this magazine, and he looks at it, he goes, yeah, you can't look at this. And this is this guy saying to me, you know, like, I'm being punished or something, yeah. And then he says, you fool. And he threw the book down, you know. And I'm like, no, 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 you're the fool, okay? All right. You're the fool, okay? I, I realize that, you know, what, what you're trying to pull here. But the thing is, is, I really have not given up anything for my salvation in Jesus Christ. I've done nothing but gain. In fact, it mentions it right here. What is it? We've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we received the spirit of adoption. I've been adopted. Are you kidding me? The Heavenly Father has adopted me. Thanks. Praise God to the Holy Spirit who's, who's made that known to me. Um, uh, I, you know, I need to show folks that, uh, that God never put me in bondage through Christ in the sense that I live in fear and anguish. I used to. I used to be in fear and a lot of anguish. I remember I used to worry about my soul. I used to be worried about a lot of things. And I used to be uh, enslaved to the, the philosophies of this world. But now I've got a free mind. I've got an open mind that's based on the Word of God. And I can see clearly now uh, because I have a Holy Spirit that has in, invited me and has brought me into the adoption of the Heavenly Father, and now I know God's will. So now I understand why things are the way they are. Do you know life down here on earth is not going to get better? It's not. These people are just working, working, working. One day, uh, you know, if I sacrifice everything and I work and I build up this career and I make all this money, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be happy and my family's going to be happy and everything else. And they, they keep thinking they're going to make it, they're going to work it better, better, better. I've read the, the book, uh, the, 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 uh, the Word of God, and I realize this earth is doomed. Amen. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. Even, listen, I, I got to admit, that even if you listen to the, the unsaved, the, the, the politicians of the day and the, the people of the day, they're worried, man. They're worried because of global warming and the global changes, all this going on, there's wars around. I sleep like a baby. You say, well, that's because you're you know, a fool or you're, you don't know. No, I sleep like a baby because I do know. My Heavenly Father, who I can call Abba, I can call Dad, I, I mean, I have that relationship, okay? And it's not one that has no respect. I have great reverence to Him as my Heavenly Father. But at the same time, here He is. He's my Heavenly Father. He, he can be yours. He can be everybody's Father. He wants to be but we have to go through his son. But I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking the fatherhood of God that we see and that we get by the Spirit. So you look there in verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. I don't even get this. I, why would God give us above this? But he, he will. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. God is saying, anything you do for the cause of Christ, any suffrage that you do for the, the cause of Jesus Christ will not go unrewarded by the Father because the Father loves it when his children honor his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and are willing to make sacrifices and give their lives uh, in his cause. 
And he says, nothing you do for the cause of Christ will go unrewarded. We must keep that in our minds. And if you get into these passages of Scripture, you will see it's worth it. Is it worth the things that you give up? Because I do have to give up things for Christ. I have, and I willingly do it. And I, Yes, because I know that there's a payday coming. And it's not, I'm not talking about hell. That's for people who are unsaved. I've been saved. I've been adopted to Christ. My payday is a different type of a payday. And that is, is the more I do for Christ and the cause of Christ, the more suffering I do, the more I'm going to be rewarded by the Father openly because of that. I don't deserve that. Nobody does. But God the Father loves us so much he's offering it to us. He says, you suffer for my son Jesus Christ. He says, as I glorify him, you're going to get glory too. We're not worthy of this. Because you don't understand. I'm your father, and I want to reward you. A good dad wants to reward his children. I, I'm, I'm sorry, if you've been raised in a family where the dad just beats you up and you just look for excuses to ridicule you, I'm sorry for that, okay? I did not live in that family. I did not grow up in that type of family. I'm talking humanly speaking. My dad uh, w was, was a good dad in the sense that he did, not, he always, he did want to reward me. He did want a, a relationship. And so I actually got a good glimpse of what the Heavenly Father is like. Although, I must admit, my, heavenly, or my earthly father could not give me near as much glory as the Heavenly Father will be. And it certainly wasn't for eternity. Can you imagine an eternity of glory for just being for his son and do, or, or being a, an adopted child of his and just giving glory and being honorable to his son Jesus Christ and suffering and doing your sacrifices for Jesus Christ for all eternity? God offers you glory, a special glory, special inheritance. We're not worthy. And yet, what a father he is. So if you didn't have a, a, a nice dad or a godly father or just one that was just nice to you, that's okay because now you can be adopted by the ultimate dad who will always be there for you and have that relationship. But you won't know that if you don't get into the book. If you don't pray and talk to him, if you keep him at bay, you're not going to understand what he's offering you as an adopted child. He's offering you a relationship that this world knows nothing of, okay? Religion tries it. We try it through a lot of religion. We try it through a lot of processes, a lot of philosophies, a lot of theology, a lot of things we come up with. But he's just offering it to you like your dad. He wants to be Abba to you. He wants to be your father. And I look at this, and I, I read this, and I'm thinking, I am so blessed. So let them laugh at me. Let them say, hey, you fool, you've given up all this stuff. Because they know not what I've gained. Amen. It's worth it. Christian, I've got so much more to give to you today or give to you in the future probably from the Word of God, but I'll, I'll let it go at this time because there's so much in this book. And by the way, when we go through the, the, this, this uh, Romans chapter 8, I'm not even doing a study of the Romans chapter 8, really. I'm just talk, talk, pulling out some things that, as they relate to the Holy Spirit. But I want to leave you with this. I want you to know and understand this, is that your life is not to be in neutral. Your life is to be engaged and God wants to be there with you in the power of the Holy Spirit and drive along with you. He wants to be a part of your life. He doesn't want to be separate from your life. He doesn't want to hover above your life. He wants to be much closer than that. That's a privilege we have today that they didn't have in the Old Testament times. The Holy Spirit wants to be right into your members of your body. And he wants to be a part of it. He wants to fellowship that close to you. What a wonderful God we have. Father, I thank you again as we just looked at just a few passages of scripture in Romans chapter 8. Father, again, there's so much more, and I know, I know there's so much I, I haven't said that I probably should say, but Father, just what, what comes to my mind and from my studies and from what I understood, Father, I hope it's enough that we understand that we have a God that loves us so much that he wants to adopt. He wants lots and lots and lots of children. And Father, I thank you so much for adopting me through the power of your Holy Spirit and through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And Father, if there's someone who doesn't know Jesus today, and he, maybe they, they've read the Bible, maybe they've been to church, maybe they've heard the message before, but may the Spirit speak to their heart and really burden them for their need to take care of their eternity, that they would trust Jesus Christ, the one who gave everything he had for them, 
that they would put their trust in that man that went to the cross who was God before he was man and died and suffered and it was accepted by the Father. Work on the hearts of those who need that. And Father, for the rest of us who have already trusted Jesus Christ, help us now to get into your book and help us to actively engage with you through prayer, Bible study, and sharing of our faith. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.